Dr. Ben Song risked everything when he used the Quantum Leap Accelerator to travel back in time. Now our team's working to find out why. As he leaps between bodies with no memory of who he is, he still has... Welcome back, everyone. This is Dave from Corman Productions with my co-host, Stacy, here to talk about the fifth episode of the Quantum Leap revival, Salvation or Bust. The episode's description reads as follows. Ben leaps to 1879 and finds himself taking on a band of outlaws, even though he's a pacifist. The episode was directed by Celius Howard. The episode was written by Margarita Matthews. Before going any further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a spoiler-free podcast, so if you haven't watched the episode, I highly recommend you go and check it out, and then come back and give us a listen. Secondly, if you are listening to this on one of my platforms that this podcast is now listenable on, please subscribe. You can also head over to my YouTube channel, Corn Productions, where this podcast can be watched as well as additional content can be discovered, both Quantum Leap related and otherwise. If you are already on my YouTube channel and like this podcast, please like, share, and comment, as well as subscribing to my channel. Now, Stacy and I were both a little skeptical coming into this episode. One, neither one of us is fans of Westerns. Mm -hmm. that, that was true of you, correct? Correct. And uh, we were also a little concerned about how extreme the time jump this was, as far as going way beyond Ben's lifetime. We thought that should happen on a more gradual basis. That being said, Stacy, your thoughts on this week's episode? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't hate the episode or anything, but I certainly wasn't in love with it. It was just kind of meh for me. I'm pretty much in the same boat. I thought the episode was okay. It definitely ended up in okay territory. There were some things I liked about it, about it but uh, yeah, this wasn't a great episode. It wasn't a bad episode. Merely okay. Okay, so we start this off episode off with Ben leaping in, having an argument with a girl he doesn't recognize, but whom turns out to be his granddaughter, Valentina. He tries to get a handle on things, but she leaves upset. He runs out to chase her and finds himself in the wild, wild west, the town of salvation. And this would be a point where a good point where the credits should play, but of course they don't. I'll get I'll get off that horse. I just I just think it should be a little bit snappier, like. Oh, we get the reveal and then credits. But yes, anyway, moving along. In the present day, we have Magic realizing that Ben remembers Addison. Addison is arguing her case, but Magic is pretty much already on her side. Pretty much arguing that this is a fluid situation. Janice is now mucking around in things, and we should uh, now see where this leads, see where his memory takes us. Right, he's ready for Addison to go and push Ben for information to really find out if he knows anything, it's time for us to know what he knows. And because he trusts Addison, even more so now that he remembers who she is, Magic thinks that, you know, it's time for her to play that advantage to get info out of Ben. Back in the past, outlaw Josiah McDonough is trying to buy out the town and get them to leave. Standing next to Ben is someone who seems irrelevant but will turn out to have significance later in the episode. Much later. The sheriff speaks up against McDonough, but is quickly gunned down. Valentina stands up and gives an impassioned speech about the place her father envisioned building. That salvation, salvation has arrived in the form of grandfather Diego, who Ben has replaced. Ben isn't thrilled, but asks for a possible non-violent solution, because he's a pacifist, you see. Okay, so I have an issue with that. Um, yeah, about the whole Ben suddenly being a pacifist thing. In the first episode, he punches a guy out. In the third episode, he's a boxer, doesn't have any problems with violence there. And in the fourth episode, he again punches someone out and is a bounty hunter during the course of that episode. Now, pacifism isn't just about not killing people. It's about nonviolence in general. So I had a little bit of an issue with that, but I don't think you care about that as much well, as I do. But to play devil's advocate here a little bit, maybe he didn't remember exactly how he felt on this subject until he hit, you know, the question of actually killing somebody. Um, it also could play into, remember, you had an issue with the fact that he just threw a drink in someone's face rather than punching them. He was a bit of a pacifist in that moment. 
where he took, you know, the course of well, uh, less resistance there. And I, I definitely hear that that about the memory thing, but at the same time, he can speak languages that, <laughs> uh, and he can somehow summon that up. So I, I don't think not having the memory fundamentally changes who you are. I think that there, there would still be that feeling there. So I think you would still have those issues, whether you remembered him being a pacifist or not, mm -hmm. is my thing. Yeah, but we haven't yet seen him face, you know, shooting somebody or using a gun at all until this episode. So. And, and I, I could understand him having moral quandaries with actively killing somebody, yeah. but that's not just being a pacifist. That's just having a problem right. killing people. And also, though, it's Addison saying you're a pacifist. Her being, you know, a former military operative, she might have a more, like, vague definition of pacifist. Saying you're a pacifist because you don't believe in shooting guns doesn't necessarily mean that's how he would classify himself. Makes um, sense. Makes sense. Okay, so Josiah says that no such non nonviolent solution exists. Either everybody leaves or there will be blood. And then we finally have our credits. You know, if we punch this up a little bit, I think that would have worked. But again, I'm going to get off that because, you know, that's just not how things work these days. Uh, ben? You're missing that oh boy moment. Yes, basically. Basically. <laughs> I, I'm missing the snappy intro. And like a lot of television shows used to have. Um, ben tells Valentina that he isn't what he used to be. And they, that he doesn't think that he can be as helpful as she wants him to be because he he himself is not a gunslinger she thinks that uh she knows exactly what he needs and conveniently walks away and i mean convenient because she has no motivated reason to do that and that's when addison shows up that's why this is convenient so that they can have their little conversation uh mainly dealing with the fallout from last week when we learned that ben remembers her and their relationship right this is the first time that they're seeing each other since, you know, that revelation, because he left right away. And uh, throughout the episode, we end up dealing with that. We end up dealing with the awkwardness of that situation. And while I appreciate it for this episode, in fact, I think we need to do that this episode. I hope that's not what we're doing every single week. Right. Like if, if we do that every episode, that's going to get old and kind of annoying. But for this episode, it works. And Addison ends up suggesting that they put aside that so that they can concentrate on the leap. We go into the saloon, which is owned by Frankie, who tells Ben that she was very close to Diego's son, which is the person that Ben has leaped into. Ben ends up turning down a prostitute, an offer of prostitute that Frankie offers her, offers him, and ends up asking for a glass of water, mm -hmm. which turns out to be eh, kind of disgusting looking. Yeah, which... I clearly saw that as a nod to Back to the Future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we yeah. have that same scene in Back to the Future 3. Marty orders a glass of water. It was gross looking. This felt like a total direct nod to that scene. Now, is that how it was in the uh, uh, history in general? Was that how our water was back in the I would imagine in the West, the water was probably pretty gross, right? Because mm. there was no uh, water treatment plants. Everything was, you know, direct well building. I imagine in the East, things were a little more advanced by this time, but I can believe that the water was pretty gross in the West. Maybe not as bad as both of those scenes indicated, but definitely it wouldn't be clear drinking water like we expect today. <laughs> Valentina turns out to be 15, which surprised me. She seems a little bit older than that. Uh, but then again, like back in the, you know, back in the old days, people grew up faster. But she also looks older than 15. Yeah, and I think her point here was, I'm 15. Of course I'm old enough to be sitting in the bar. <laughs> right, because standards are very different from Ben's time to her time. Ben seems to be trying to convince her to leave because of the shops boarding up and it's not safe. Which, according to Frankie, is because of the gold mine uh, basically drying up. So their source of income has dried out. Right. Uh, Marco, which is Diego's son, had built this town around the fact that there was a gold vein nearby. And now that that's gone, the town's kind of already falling apart a little bit, even before you deal with, uh, you know, this uh, outlaw and the railroad and all of that that's happening right now. And Ben asks a natural question. Why stay then? Right. Frankie says that this was a place built by outsiders 
or outsiders. People like her would not be able to get a loan yeah. or own a business. And that because specifically speaking, Frankie is black. They don't go into the racial issues uh, very much in this episode. Even though sometimes I thought they could have gone a little further with yeah. it. Because this is the old, old West. Right. This is a very different time frame. Now, Frankie's saying that specifically. I felt like that was an Easter egg to um, Pool Hall Blues. So in Pool Hall Blues, the uh, the character Sam leaped into, her, his daughter was trying to get a business loan as a black woman. And this was in the 1950s. Couldn't get a business loan. And I feel like uh, Frankie saying, yeah, anywhere else, I wouldn't have been able to get a business loan. Really seemed like a nod to that. Really showing without saying explicitly, yeah, this town is made of minorities and they're in their own little bubble, right? They're not really part of uh, society outside of this town. They have their own whole entire culture here. Hmm, interesting. Frankie ends up bringing out Diego's old guns that I guess his father left for him. And Ben ends up suggesting that, once again, that there has to be a non-violent solution to the town's problems. And he suggests throwing money at the problem. And he's going to get the sheriff's deputies involved. Back at the project, Addison is trying to get more information from Ziggy when we learn that the congressman, who is not Tom, unfortunately, I was <laughs> wrong about that, the congresswoman in this case was Adani, She's visiting the project, so they have to act like the whole unauthorized leap thing isn't happening. Magic ends up greeting her, but she wants to see Ben. Ma Magic ends up, ends up making an excuse about family problems, but the congressman woman decides that she wants to talk to the entire team individually, probably so that they can't get their stories straight. Right, and you can tell already she's very suspicious. She obviously knows something is up. And honestly, they should have been ready for this. They should have had their story straight already. And it feels like they weren't expecting this to happen. And yes, like you just said, they probably should have seen that coming. Uh, back in the past, we find out that Diego was found dead from liver failure in 1986. Six, 1886. Right, 1886. <laughs> my bad. Uh, six years after this. Now, my issue with this... We just learned that the congresswoman is there interfering with the project so they can't get information. So how then does Addison get any information? Because it doesn't seem like, you know, at back at the project, they can get information without arousing suspicions. Well, maybe she already had that fact downloaded into the handling. <laughs> well, thank God for that, I guess. <laughs> According to Ziggy, he's there to save salvation. And it's Addison's idea to capture... The main outlaw guy, whose name, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the guy's name ever. Like Josiah McDonough. Okay, you're going to have to remind me about five more times. <laughs> McDonough, McDonough, McDonough. All right, moving on. Ben is trying to get the sheriff's deputies involved, but they are riding away. He's hoping that perhaps they are going to go face this outlaw. But according to a cowboy named Henry, we don't get his name here, but we do later. They are not going to help, but they are in fact quitting because McDonough paid them off. Yeah, which is what happened in the original history, right? They, These uh, outlaws successfully drove everyone out of town. Either they left on their free will or they killed them and they split up the entire town. So this is really the start of that as you see the law has gone. Now, I would like to say that I would be heroic here, but I would probably take the money myself. All right, McDonough tries to buy Ben off, but Ben says no. And McDonough says, well, you either better leave or something bad is going to happen to you. He ends up giving Ben a gun for some reason. Uh, I, he doesn't have guns of his own. Why is McDonough giving him a gun? Right. He just got his son's guns. I'm not sure. So Ben has two problems here. One, Ben has moral issues with killing people. And the other is he can't shoot straight to save his life. Right. Probably literally. Yeah, he's probably never shot a gun before, Ben. In fact, that's actually stated in the episode yeah. that he's never fired and a gun. Addison, and several times this episode makes it very clear, you are in this person's body. And she makes it sound like he should be able to shoot a gun because uh, Diego knows how to shoot a gun. That's not necessarily the case. He doesn't have, he might have Diego's abilities, but not necessarily his skill. Right. Not to mention, as Ben points out, 
He's an old man. Right. So he says, well, the reason he can't shoot is because he's he's an old man and forgot how. But I don't know. It feels like they're they're already going back and forth with how this works. Right. Like if you are coming here because you can add something to the table that the other person couldn't, it doesn't make sense that you're going to have their exact skill sets. Right. And then demonstrates his lack of skills by not being able to shoot some bottles down even with Addison's help, but the sexual tension there might be the reason why that didn't work. Ben ends up asking for a prid quo quo, asking about their first date. He will attempt to fire this gun and shoot these cans if Addison will tell him about their first date. And according to Addison, they actually knew each other for years, dated other people, and when they were kind of single, I'm very kind of curious as to what that means. Right. <laughs> Uh, they went out to a Chinese place, and she ended up going back to this place, and she never left. Addison has to leave to go talk to Congresswoman Adani, and that's when Henry, the deputy that didn't quit taking McDonough's bribes, tries to help Ben. Henry came to Salvation because he didn't want to be what people saw him as. He wanted to go there to be a different man, and he will defend this town with his life. Now... I haven't pointed out the fact that Henry is also black, mm -hmm. and I thought that might be an issue. But as it turns out, there actually were black cowboys back in yeah. the Wild West. Well, um, that seems like a great place for me to mention. You know, I did some research into this situation. The town of Salvation obviously is fictional, but there were um, towns like this that were made up entirely of minorities. Um, they were called Freedom Towns. And the, normally I, uh, I read that it was uh, predominantly black people who made up these towns and they were freed slaves. So they, uh, after getting out of slavery, they went and founded these towns and there were actually lots of them. There were at least 50 of these towns at the time throughout um, the West. So it seems like this is definitely meant to kind of mirror that type of a town. I didn't see, and I didn't dig too deep into this, but I didn't see references of there being you know, mixed minority races like we see here. These were specifically talking about freed slaves, but this town definitely has that feel where almost everyone here is not white. And of course, the bad guy here is a white guy come into town. <laughs> oh, you know, I didn't even notice that. That might add fuel to the fire of this show being woke. And I thought that too. I was like, you know, the people who keep saying that are going to have issue with this. But then I remembered those people stopped watching. So right, right. they didn't get a chance to see this, so they could, can't complain about it. I mean, most, most of the people that were complaining didn't even watch episode one. Yeah. Ben ends up shooting, again, inspired by Henry's words, but he just ends up ricocheting a bullet off of something and hitting himself. Yeah, he literally shoots himself. <laughs> ben asks for a doctor, and I'm kind of curious as to how effective a doctor in 1879 would be against anything, really. Uh, in the present day, Congresswoman Adani talks to Addison, and Addison basically yes mams her and no mams her to death, and basically gives her no information. Mm -hmm. I did find it interesting, the team's various approaches to Congressman Adani. Here, she gives nothing, mm -hmm. basically away at all. But also, in giving nothing, she gave away an awful lot. That's kind of proving you have a secret. If Yeah, <laughs> if you act like that, you're basically saying, yep, I'm trying to cover something up. Right. <laughs> Oh, also, we learned in that scene um, that Addison is a captain. I don't know if they specifically said that before, but that is her rank in the military. She's a captain. I definitely don't yeah. recall that coming up in the past. Yeah, for sure. um, Adani called her captain. In the past, Dr. Ming treats the wound with aloe. Was aloe a thing back then? I didn't... Well, aloe is a plant. Oh, well, yes. But were they actually specifically using it to, for wounds like this back then? I guess so, but... Um, sure. I don't okay. know. I don't know. You didn't look into it. I course. didn't look into that, no. <laughs> That's a minor... And that issue. may have been more of, you know, a homeopathic uh, mm. witch doctor type of thing at this point. Ming's father gives Ben soup, wonton soup, which he tries to pay for, but they won't accept it because they respect Valentina, her, his granddaughter. And note that he had just talked to Addison about how their first date was Chinese food. So. Oh, yeah, that's a nice little connection that yeah. I didn't get. They hear an explosion, and it turns out to be someone's shop. And surprise, surprise, it was McDonough's doing. 
Reeves, the owner, talks about how he's basically lost everything and has nowhere to go. Mainly because he was a black guy, and during this time they had limited opportunities. So this was a big opportunity for him, and now it's gone. But Valentina steps up and says that they will help him rebuild, all of them. Even as they see more townspeople leave taking McDonough's bribes. Or are just out of fear. Ben tries to argue once again for nonviolence, but this doesn't go over very well. Valentina basically calls him a coward and says that he is nothing to her. Well, that had to hurt a little bit, even if it's not actually his granddaughter. In the present day, we see get Jen talking to mm. Adani. Which was a great scene in this episode. We got some background into some things that you wanted to know about her past that is was hinted at yeah in the, magic in, the um, past. in the past like all we had really known was that magic kind of took a chance on her right and mm. we really got to find out here exactly what that means which i wasn't expecting that um we found out that uh to quote jen is a former cyber criminal who went from hacking bitcoin accounts on the dark web to being the leader of this pro uh security here and that magic had lobbied to get her released from prison which that's a lot of information yes right yes absolutely and it brings up questions for me like why did magic lobby to get her out of prison is it because like he knew she was the best and needed him on this project or is there some more of a personal connection here of why she specifically needs to be there and jen's approach here is to basically play it by the book and say, well, I'd like to help you out here, but you don't have your authorization or your clearance in writing. So I'm afraid I can't help you. Yeah. But again, like what you said, that also brings up the fact that, hey, there's a secret here to uncover. Right. So it speaks louder than words in that way. In the past, Ben is drunk and wallowing in his failures, both past and present. Ben thinks... Maybe he can't save Salvation, but he can perhaps save Valentina. And I'm, I'm kind of figuring, wondering how he even figures this. Because the last thing Valentina said to him is that he was nothing to her. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a relationship that's you know, not in the best of terms right now. But, you know, that, that fits with what Quantum Leap is. You know, like this is something uh, Sam faced a lot was just fixing relationships between family members and not really changing the world but just changing somebody's life in a smaller way so it makes sense that he would think maybe i'm here for their relationship perhaps uh we see the figure that we've seen in the background a couple of times watching ben go and we have to figure at this point that him watching this scene is significant somehow but we don't know how yet ben goes to valentina but she has taken ben's guns and decided to go face off against mcdonough spoiler alert this doesn't go well. Uh, you saw this as a connection to the original yeah, series. Yeah, I said we've seen this scene before. And, um, you know, every episode we talk about the episode from the original series that's most closely linked to that episode. Like we had a boxing episode. We had a bounty hunter episode. Well, the closest thing we had to this Western was um, the episode The Last Gunfighter from season four. And obviously it's different because that episode took place in the 1950s not in the 1800s yeah it was a western it was a town pretending to be yeah it was it was a town celebrating their centennial it was what they were having a centennial celebration talking about how their town was built in the 1800s and the character sam leaped into was an old man tyler means who had been around in the 1870s same time period we are here and of course in that time he was a young man and he supposedly had this famous gunfight and he's reenacting it now as an old man and one of the things that happened in that episode is that character's grandson steals the guns right and this felt like the exact same thing happening we've got the granddaughter stealing the guns and i mentioned to you earlier i also recall like an identical storyline in an episode of sliders right right um and that my, was like a second season episode my brain that, kind so of always has morphed that episode of quantum leap and that episode of sliders because they were so similar and i probably watched them around the same time in my life and i feel like i've seen that story other places too i can't pinpoint exactly but it feels like up to this point we're following this identical story we've got somebody who is you know who used to be a gunfighter or 
they, people think they should be a gunfighter and they've been challenged to a duel and there's a child involved and the child's now in danger because of they stole the guns and like we've done this <laughs> i feel like it's not a nod only but it's really like an identical it's a trope really. yeah like very much so so uh it ends about the same way uh she ends up getting captured and mcdonough ends up facing ben they Ben wants to talk because he's still trying to find a non-violent solution to this problem. And he, for a second there, it seems like McGonagall is going to, like, you know, give him that non-violent solution. Yeah, he's like, I got an answer that's going to, you know, save everybody. So Ben thinks, oh, wow, maybe this guy isn't so bad yeah, after all. Yeah, maybe we can talk this out. Not so much. His solution is to basically kill Ben. Yeah, he says, like, yeah, if you just kind of let me gun you down, then you'll save everybody. <laughs> right, that everybody will leave the town and there will be no further violence. Yeah, I don't want to kill anybody. Just you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, gunfight at noon. It isn't specifically said at noon, but that's how Westerns go. Oh, uh, well, no, actually, Ben is the one who said, I'll see you at high noon. Oh, did he actually say he, that? Ben actually said I that, which that. I found funny because... I half expected McDonough to be like, noon, why noon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when I eat lunch. I don't want to <laughs> shoot people at noon. Or ever, really, but, you know. The townspeople are happy. They think they're going to be saved. But, you know, Ben's over there like, um, I don't have a chance here. Like, what, what am I going to do? And Addison suggests that he use the town's talents as a means to get out of the situation. And you talked about how... This is consistent with Ben's character. Yeah, what we've learned about Ben is that, you know, back at the project, he was the one who tended to get everybody on the same page, even when they disagreed about things. And he was just really good at pulling people together and getting them to work together. He used this strength um, in Atlantis, um, getting the crew of that uh, shuttle yes. together to come up with solutions. And it seems to be what he's really good at is just thinking outside of the box and bringing people together, which is what he does here. And I like the fact that it didn't come down to a gunfight, because if it did, I would have found that extremely unrealistic. Ben was unable to even shoot a can in this episode, yeah. never mind win a gunfight. And so against a young, you know, big shot outlaw. <laughs> right. That that would not have been realistic at all. So I'm glad that Ben actually found the solution that he was looking for even if it wasn't totally in the spirit of what he wanted. Uh, so what he ends up suggesting is that they try to capture the outlaw, not killing any of the gang, and getting the reward money so that they can pay off mm -hmm. the railroad company that's trying to buy their town. Right. Which, I find it silly that that would work, because, I mean, didn't isn't the railroad who basically hired these goons to come drive everybody out of town? Basically, so if they... <laughs> yeah, I don't see how this works, but yeah. And also, weren't I mean, maybe this is also a trope, but wasn't it usually wanted dead or alive mm. in order to get rewards? Why would they have to catch these people alive in order to get the money? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember. We did see the poster earlier. I don't remember what it said, but yeah, uh, that's a good question. Maybe it's just because, once again, Ben is trying to find a non-violent, non-killing solution. Yeah. Um, Ian ends up meeting with Adani. And her strategy is to basically use technical jargon to overwhelm the senator. And it doesn't end up working all that well. Yeah. Um, Adani saw right through that. I thought it was a good strategy, though. I, it just, I'm sorry that it did not work for Ian. In the past, Ben ends up rallying the town together, setting up a bunch of traps. And this ends up working. <laughs> they end up capturing McDonough and the gang without killing anybody. And the town is saved. Meanwhile, back at the project, Jen has dug up some dirt on the senator and suggests Magic use it to blackmail her. But Magic doesn't want to do it because of his own moral quandaries. And he ends up finding a creative solution that, uh, that solves his problem, which kind of ties into the main story as well. They both find solutions, Ben and Magic, out of their problems that don't involve what they don't want to do, basically. In the present day, Adani reveals that she basically knew what, what was going on that an unauthorized leap had taken place. And basically the team all but confirmed it to her. Ben, instead of using the blackmail, ends up suggesting that they can send Ben back to save her brother. I guess uh, there was some kind of car accident that Adani was behind the wheel of. Mm -hmm. And 
magic says to her that they can basically prevent this from happening. Yeah, as long as she gives them enough time to figure out how to do it. Now, this is completely bullcrap right. on Magic's part. This they don't a, know how to do that. This is a stalling tactic. And Even if they get Ben back, they don't know how to send him to a specific point in time. That's never been part of this. Although Janice might know how to do it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe they can get into bed with Janice to solve their problems. But if they get Ben back, then there's no problem anymore. Though I, I still think they would uh, have to contend with the fact that they made the unauthorized leap in the first place. Yeah. So and this also shows us that, you know, Adani's working on her own here. She wasn't sent by the Pentagon. She's threatening to go to them mm. with this information. Um, Magic ends up telling Jen and Ian that they, that he bought them some time and to use it to get Ben home. Yeah, because eventually this is she's going to come back and uh, expect some results. They definitely cannot do this forever, that's for sure. Back in the past, the town is saved. Addison ends up suggesting... That the town go and find the copper deposits that will further help the town's future. And then Ben is accosted in the background by a guy who knows all about Ben and threatens him and tells him to stop following him. And this is clearly a leaper. Yes. But who is this leaper exactly? Is it the person, are we seeing the leaper for who he really is or right. is somebody in that And that's body? something I was questioning. Now... As we learned in the original series, and they may or may not follow the same uh, rules, but when Ben and one of the evil leapers touched each other is when they saw each other's true selves. So, did Ben and this person touch? I mean, he does kind of thrust his fingers at Ben's midsection, or at his, like, like throat area. Yeah. But I don't know that that's enough. To like, because he touches his clothes and maybe right. not his skin. And I feel like when Ben and Aaliyah touched, it was skin to skin contact. So that might have something to do with that, or it could just be the fact that the the guy that's there is the leaper, right? Kind of like Sam. Right. It could have already shown us his true form. We don't know. And uh, currently, we don't know who this person is, but uh, it is clearly the person that Janice was after. Is this an evil leaper? That was a, one of the speculations that were out there. Is it somebody else? It's definitely not Sam. Yeah, there was people speculating it could be Sam. I threw that right out the window. This person mm -hmm. didn't act like Sam would have acted. Yeah, that was my main reason for immediately yeah. rejecting And also, idea. this person knows who Ben is. He says, you're Dr. Ben Song from the year 2022. Uh, Sam wouldn't know that <laughs> if he <laughs> ran into Sam. Right, right. Sam has, as far as we know, no link to the future to know anything. Exactly. Uh, you had one other huge problem with how this episode ends. Yeah, so what happened is, you know, they put Salvation on the map, they saved it. Instead of everybody getting run out of town or killed, they all kind of live here happily ever after. This would have huge implications on the timeline as we know it. And I don't know, Quantum Leap has never really done that, right? They've always focused on these tiny changes that are kind of isolated to a few people, and sure, there's ripples to that. You know, we met Samantha Stratton. Like, we know there's ripples to the changes Sam made in history, but to make a change that involves so many people, a whole town, and it's almost 150 years ago, there's going to be big, big ripples. And we should be at the point where Addison comes back and, like, there's huge changes that she can notice right away. It's not even just the people that are affected, but geography as well. Because right. Salvation, the town still exists. And the railroad company isn't building through there now. So yeah. that's going to affect things that way I don't think they too. told us exactly where Salvation is supposed to be. But it definitely would have some effect on modern day uh, geography and, and government and all of that. And the people involved. So... This was my my thought, you know, and some of this comes from being a fan of the TV show Timeless. I know I've mentioned that a lot and I don't want to go off on a whole tangent about Timeless, but that's what happens in Timeless is small changes in history end up causing huge changes in the present day. And their whole thing in that show is to try and prevent these changes from happening. Because if someone uh, who's supposed to die in the past doesn't die they could go on to have descendants who weren't originally supposed to exist. Those people are then going to have more babies that weren't supposed to exist. 
and the people that they end up having babies with are now going to not end up with other people and when you multiply this by all the people in this town and all of the descendants that they could have had in the original timeline because they moved somewhere else and met people that they're now not going to meet because they didn't move there um a lot of people are going to be deleted from existence who originally you know let's say somebody from this town moved away and met somebody there and they had you know 10 kids and all of those 10 kids had a bunch of kids and you go 150 years you've got hundreds of people just from that one person that now don't exist and then you're going to have new people that exist because now they had new babies 150 years ago that didn't originally exist so it's not just a couple people or one family timeline. It's literally like lots and lots and lots and lots, probably thousands of people could be affected by this, like directly affected as an existing and not existing. And of course, Quantum Leap is not going to tackle that no, at all. because that's not what Quantum Leap is. So I guess to put it bluntly, my problem with this is going back that far in the past and having such a big change it doesn't seem to fit the mold of what they're doing. And it doesn't seem like that should have such insequential consequences as they're going to play it off as having. Yeah, like like I said, mo usually the changes are small. They affect a few people. They're going to affect things. We're going to see ripples. I, I still think we're going to see ripple more ripples in this series from changes that happened in the original series. But this was just, it felt like too broad of a stroke. And if Ben had been there just to like repair a relationship between valentina and her grandfather i think that would have made more sense than, right that would be oh, more you're here to save the town <laughs> right that's more that's more in the spirit of the series than what we got presented here for yeah. sure and they're like yay you did it you put the town on the map well that's not necessarily a good thing for right a lot of people right like to make that big of a change it just felt it felt not right mm. to me um yeah, a couple more things I want to talk about. One is, uh, at some point in this episode, and I don't remember exactly where it was, we had this train of uh, conversation where Ben says to Addison, I realize I haven't slept since I leapt. Oh, yes. yes. And Addison says, well, the hosts you've jumped into have, if that's any constellation. So one, did Ben mean he didn't sleep in this leap or he literally hasn't slept since he leapt the first time? I, I, I kind of took it to mean that that he hasn't slept at all since he started yeah. leaping. Her response made me think that's what they meant for her to say your hosts have. So so two things here. One, he ha literally hasn't slept in five leaps. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> I, I can see, okay, in the first leap, that took place in one day. There was no night cycle. Sure, it makes sense he didn't sleep there. On the space shuttle, yeah, probably didn't get a lot of sleep during that. It was a few hours and a lot of stuff was happening. And even if he had a chance to sleep, he's probably not gonna be able to sleep, right? And with zero gravity. <laughs> The third this, episode. The third episode is where definitely. I don't know. He, I mean, I think the uh, the title fight occurred the next day. So there yeah, was at he least was there one... multiple days. He should have had a chance to sleep, right? Or did he literally practice all night long? Yeah, I don't think that would be very good for. I feel a title like fight. he would have needed to sleep at some point now, going on multiple days of adventures, right? So I was a little taken back by that. I have realized I haven't slept since I left. Hmm. And okay, so the other half of this conversation is Addison saying your hosts have. So she's pretty much saying they're asleep the whole time you're in them. Well, I I took that to mean more like the host has had a normal night's rest. So you leapt into someone who's had a normal night's rest. Not necessarily that the host is hmm. themselves asleep during the week. I think you're, yeah, I think that's not what quite what she meant So by you that. think she meant, well, they were rested when you got here? Basically. So their bodies are rested, even if Ben has slept. Which means, even though you haven't slept, you shouldn't be feeling the effects of it because the people you're leaping into, and she keeps pushing the whole, you are them. Right. Ha haven't been up for five, six days. Right, exactly. Hmm. That That's my take on it. Okay. And another, uh, another time in this episode, we got that whole pushing it down our throats that he's in their bodies was when he was drinking. And he's like, well, it's not my body I'm poisoning. I mean, that's kind of being, uh, you know, a bit of a butthead, you know? Oh, You're, man. You know, like giving this guy like lots of drinks so that he can have a hangover when he comes back. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, 
And the only other thing was just a little bit more about the sleeper. Um, who all could it be, right? Who? What are our options here? We've ruled out Sam. Yeah, we have. The internet hasn't. Some people really think it's Sam. Uh, other people were speculating that it was Janice somehow. Yeah, I saw a lot of people. I had this conversation with people on Facebook as well as on Twitter, and I've seen a solid handful of people replying that they're pretty convinced it's Janice. And I don't know. I don't follow that logic. I don't see how that's an option because Jan Janice was working with Ben, and Janice sent Ben on this journey. Right? Unless Janice is for some reason sending Ben after herself, which doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, it, the whole the whole concept that it could be Janice doesn't make sense to me because Janice is the one who programmed this leap or all of the leaps. You know, we ha we've seen the coordinates and presumably Janice knows what all these coordinates are. So even if it was Janice leaping at some point, she would know that Ben has no control over where he's going. So it wouldn't make sense for Janice to say to Ben, stop following me. I feel like this person thinks Ben is intentionally following them. And perhaps he is, but he doesn't remember that that's what he's doing. Right. He doesn't remember his own agenda. Yeah. And he might so, not even know the actual agenda. Right. So Janice probably knows about this person and Janice probably sent Ben after this person on purpose. But I don't think that fits with it being Janice. <laughs> right, right. No, that doesn't make any sense. So I don't think it's Ben. Uh, sorry, don't think it's Sam. Don't think it's Janice. Could be an evil leaper. It could be an evil leaper, someone um, associated with that program, which we know very little about. Uh, so far, there's been no real indication if they are continuing that storyline at all. And you can't really judge it based on how that guy was acting. He was acting hostile, but that doesn't mean his intentions are evil. Right. But if we stick to um, the original canon of the series, evil leapers exist. At some point, in some place, evil leapers exist. Well, you also brought up the fact that there were other leapers suggested by the original series, specifically in the series finale. Yes. With, with Strapa in that bar, Al's place. Uh, so we, we did learn that there's addition, there's other people out there leaping besides the evil weepers and Sam. Right. We know that there are other people traveling in time. Where or when they're from, we don't know. Or um, even how. Why they're leaping, how they're leaping. You know, Al, the bartender, suggested to Sam, you have total control over it. It has nothing to do with you getting in this machine. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of... There's a lot of lore and there's a lot of holes in it and room for speculation. And I don't know, I'm a little scared for them making something canon that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like they could make this a really great story and I feel like they could kind of ruin the whole thing here. There's definitely a lot of directions that they can go in. We'll definitely see which direction they go in. Some better than others, for sure. Mm -hmm. My kind of instinct thought here is that it has something to do with the current day project um, and something to do with, you know, the people that we've met, um, maybe even somebody in the future from the moment we are leaps. And because remember, Janice has been studying what they're going to do in the future, like she's been using Ziggy to predict their future actions. Maybe it's somebody from the project or somebody, you know, this congresswoman or somebody um, that she sends forth in time in the future. I don't know. They could really they could really do anything they want with this. Right. Because it's time travel. Right. It absolutely. could be anybody from any time. And the only kicker is they have to explain how Janice knows about it. Right. In order to um, set up this project. But, you know, I just thought. If this all involves something that hasn't happened yet in the current timeline, that might help explain why Janice and Ben were able to put this code together in only six months. Maybe it came from the future. Hmm, that's interesting. And somebody leapt back and gave this information to Janice or Ben. There's definitely no shortage of ways they can go with this, for sure. No. And I still feel like at this point, it could be ambiguous whether we're involving Sam in this greater story or not. And I feel like they could even be writing this two totally different ways, waiting to find out if Scott Bakula is <laughs> going to come back. 
one one involved one involving Sam, one totally not involving Sam. Right. I still and, feel like they could be riding that fence. I think that's actually the best way to go about it, since we don't know if we're ever going to get Scott Bakula back. Any additional thoughts? Um. Well, the only other thing I have to note is that at the end of the episode, um, we got that whole interaction with the other Leaper. We didn't see a leap in to the next episode. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Usually, I mean... In the original series, there were times where we didn't see the leap to the next episode. But usually it's when they showed us a leap in that we've already seen, right? They had all right. those episodes where they were just kind of showing rerun leap ins. Um, and occasionally we got no leap in at all. Like mostly um, what's coming to mind is at the end of MIA, we didn't see the leap in there. Well, I think that has to do with the fact that this was the last episode shot and they weren't quite sure which episode they were going to go with for their sixth episode, which is going to be the pilot right. episode of the original series. Right. Or, and I think sorry, that was logistically why they didn't show us the leap in is because when they were working on this, they weren't sure what that that was going to be the next episode that had been filmed as the pilot. So there was some ambiguity about episode order here when they were creating these episodes. Um, but yeah, it, it, it felt noteworthy that we didn't get a leap in. And I actually saw some people questioning it, like, well, where is he going next? They didn't show us. Um, but then they did show the trailer if you watched it um, live. If you watched it on Peacock, they don't show the trailers. Another very brief trailer. I, of course, sought it out on YouTube. Yeah, it was a brief trailer confirming that we are definitely getting the San Francisco Earthquake episode, as we have been told that that's going to be um, the next episode. And we saw Ben is in trouble. He gets, um, he's like, I don't know if he's unconscious or he's, he's just, he's pegged under a, a fallen beam or something. And I think that's pretty much all I caught out of it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with this because they had to obviously reshoot quite a bit of this episode mm -hmm. to make it make sense. To make it not the pilot. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what kind of scenes we get at the project and... I'm I'm wondering if they're going to explain all the rules that they haven't explained thus far into the series. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of half expecting them to address what's going on with the host during these leaps. We don't have a waiting room. Um, I've seen it kind of said that the creators don't specifically didn't want a waiting room. Um, but what is happening? Where are they? You know, where's Ben's body if he's not... His body's not going with him. And I feel like we might get some of that addressed here since it was filmed to be the pilot. And I also feel if we don't get any of that now, we probably won't ever get it. It's going to definitely play oddly to the general populace who doesn't follow like what's going on with the series. They don't read the news about the series. They just watch the show. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything that's going on. If suddenly they're explaining all the rules that they really should have done in the pilot episode yeah. of the series. So it's going to play pretty weird for them. And also I'm going to expect there not to be, for example, discussions about Ben and Addison's relationship. Because when they were filming all of the earthquake scenes, Ben wouldn't have known about that. Right. Um, I'm just hoping it's not too obvious. I did. Uh... That they changed this from what it was supposed to be. I did read somewhere that in the original pilot, uh, before they reshot everything, they actually didn't reveal that Addison and Ben mm. were a couple until the very end of that episode. Uh, they obviously changed that when they did the new pilot, but yes, I just thought that was interesting. It's fun to think there's already all this deleted footage out there. <laughs> I wonder if we'll ever get to see it. Like whole different, you know, explanations of the whole you are a time traveler <laughs> bit. So I think that about does it for us. We would like to hear from you what you think of the podcast, what you think of the episode itself. Stacy can be reached at. I can be reached on Twitter at TV and Coupon Talk. If you like this video and want to support the channel, you can follow me on Twitter at Core Productions. You can buy me something from the Core Production Store on Zazzle. You can buy me a copy, which is a new way to support content creators such as myself. You can follow and subscribe to my podcast. On my YouTube channel, you can like, share, and comment on this podcast, as well as subscribing to my channel. This is Dave and Stacy from Corn Productions, signing off.